Guardianship is intended to create a flexible vehicle to maximize freedom whilst at the same time protecting the person insofar as their welfare is concerned and protecting others. It's intended to provide a real alternative, a less restrictive alternative to being in hospital and in an institution. That's its purpose. But of course, as we've heard this morning, it is a very authoritative regime. That's why we have it often. Often the very purpose of using guardianship is to provide authority and to provide a structure in a person's life. Some might say a parental figure. And many would say, and Tony referred to this this morning, that it's toothless that it's really based on consensus and cooperation. When in fact, and I agree with Tony, it's far from toothless. There are certain things for which it may need a dentist so far as treatment is concerned, because obviously guardianship has nothing to do with treatment at all or personal care. It provides no legal authority to treat. You can take them there for the purposes of treatment, but the treatment itself will not be governed by the Mental Health Act. It will be the common law if they've got capacity, or the Mental Capacity Act if they lack it. So that's the intention and purpose of guardianship, but of course intention is one thing and the effect is quite another. And some would say, some have argued, that if you are able to convey someone somewhere require them to live there, and if they abscond, be able to bring them back there, surely, they say, that is a deprivation of liberty. Now, by way of a quick recap, Article 5, as you know, protects our right to liberty. No one, including a guardian, can deprive us of liberty, except on certain grounds, such as mental disorder, or unsound mind, as, as the phrase is used in the European Convention. And crucially, it must be in accordance with a procedure that's prescribed by law. So, is it a deprivation of liberty to use guardianship? Well, at the moment, pending the Supreme Court's decision, I don't think it necessarily is. And you've got the Blackburn decision, that Tony referred to earlier, where of course the court said he wasn't deprived of his liberty whilst under guardianship. But it is controversial. And of course, the legality of a guardianship order depends on exactly where the threshold is for deprivation of liberty. And I hope you will forgive me for using a water metaphor, given the weather. But if you imagine um, we have this distinction in law, don't we, between restricting our movement and depriving us of our liberty. And the difference is one of degree or intensity. Okay? Now, at some point, the restrictions on our liberty will be so intense as to cross a line and then you're in the realms of deprivation of liberty. That's when you need a procedure. So if you imagine, the Article 5 threshold is like a water line. Restricting liberty is above the water. Depriving liberty is below the water. And as soon as you go, as soon as you touch your toes into the water, you need a legal procedure. And for the reasons I'm going to give in a minute, guardianship cannot authorise and provide that procedure. So the legality of guardianship very much depends on where that water level is. And of course, we don't know what's going to happen with the Cheshire West case. They may raise the water level, they may keep it where it is. But of course, if it is raised, there is a risk of flooding. And guardianship will need some kind of amphibious legal regime to keep it from flood damage. 
And in the Cheshire West case, as you may have seen, if you were sad enough to watch it on Sky, um, in essence, there were two competing arguments. On the one hand, the local authorities were contending that a deprivation of liberty, in essence, involves coerced confinement by reference to a spectrum of relative normality, which sets the waterline quite low. On the other hand, it was argued that the test is simply whether the person is free to leave. If you're not free to leave, you're deprived, was the argument, which sets the water level very high. Now, of course, when it comes to care homes, and when it comes to those that lack capacity to make decisions, we have doles available. Doles can provide the amphibious vehicle that we need to keep everything above board. But as soon as we get into the realms of Article 5, particularly in some other settings, such as supported living, or in someone's own home. And one of the questions this morning was, well, to what extent can we use guardianship for someone in their own home? Well, if they're deprived of their liberty in their own home, you can't use guardianship, at least not by itself. You need something else. And this um, slide gives you uh, an overview. It gives you a picture for the different areas of law and how they interface with each other. So if you imagine the background, um, you have the common law, the sea of common law, which is very clear, pretty blunt. If you have capacity to make your own decision, your decision must be respected. If I have the capacity, therefore, to live in squalor, so be it. Then we have the Mental Health Act that provides an exception to that rule, because, of course, you can detain someone even if they've got the capacity to refuse to go to hospital. And so far as guardianship is concerned, you can use guardianship on a capacitous refusing patient. But it's rarely used, whereas the Mental Capacity Act applies to about 2 million people, it's thought. There are about 6 million of us that are involved in caring for those that lack capacity. And doles at the moment only applies to hospitals and care homes. Now, Tony has touched on the interface issue, and all I would say there is that, of course, you can use dolls and guardianship if you need to. I would probably go further and say that the legislation expressly envisages the use of both of them. Otherwise, why is guardianship on the list? So why can we not lawfully deprive someone of their liberty under guardianship? Well, there are principally five reasons, and I think the most important is the first. The burden of proof is the wrong way round. If you detain someone under Article 5, the detaining authority bears the responsibility of showing that you need to be detained. But for guardianship, it, the responsibility, the burden, is on the person, on the patient, which is just not human rights compliant. And that alone means we cannot lawfully deprive liberty under guardianship, because the government didn't swap the burden. The second reason, and this was mentioned this morning, is potentially the MH case. MH talks about if you've got someone who lacks capacity in detention, you may have to sort of compensate for that incapacity with additional safeguards. Now, under guardianship, the person may lack capacity. And, of course, there is no automatic referral to the tribunal. So there's a lack of procedural safeguards there. Thirdly, the criteria might not necessarily conform with some of the European case law. Winterwerp says that you can only lawfully detain someone on the grounds of an unsound mind if the mental disorder is of a nature or degree that warrants detention. Now, how does that compare to guardianship? Well, guardianship talks about whether your mental disorder warrants reception 
into guardianship, whether it's necessary in the interest of your welfare or to protect others. It sounds a little looser than perhaps what Europe requires. And the fourth reason is it's likely to be unlawful. If you've got someone who is detained under the Mental Health Act in hospital, and the issue is whether to discharge them from hospital detention into guardianship detention, that's likely to be unlawful because, of course, it's not a discharge. You can't really say that you are discharging them from hospital detention if they're still going to be detained in the community. And the case I've mentioned there involved a situation where they tried to, the tribunal, try to conditionally discharge a forensic patient from hospital into the community subject to conditions that were so intensive as to amount to a deprivation. And they said, well, you just can't describe that as a discharge in its ordinary uh, sense. So equally, there's likely to be a problem if guardianship was used to detain someone from hospital. And finally, and I'll come back to this later on, if someone was detained under guardianship, the tribunal's powers are quite limited. It's all or nothing, really, so far as the tribunal is concerned. Much like with community treatment order scenarios, the tribunal has no power to vary the conditions if they think that they're a bit OTT. Again, with guardianship, if the person is deprived of their liberty, the tribunal's decision is simply whether or not the person should be subject to that regime. It's not nuanced. That they don't have more flexible powers to try and tinker with the restrictiveness of that regime. So you're either subject to guardianship or you're not. Now, of course, as I say, with care homes, and if the person lacks capacity, you can use both. As you uh, may have experienced, the line that's drawn between doles and the Mental Health Act is a nightmare. It's very badly drafted, I think. Um, and I'll try to simplify it here as best as I can by saying that someone is eligible for doles. In other words, you can detain someone in a hospital or care home under that regime unless, firstly, they are detained under one of those sections of the Mental Health Act, or secondly, they're subject to Section 17, leave, etc., or guardianship, and Dole's detention would be incompatible. So it follows from that that provided, really, in essence, you're talking about the same care home, you can use Dole's with guardianship. Whether you need to is, is a slightly different question, I think. But so far as eligibility and compatibility is concerned, you can use both, and they do slightly different things, if you think about it. You can't deprive under guardianship, but dolls can be used to provide that procedure. And then we have uh, a scenario, so far as hospitals is concerned, which is very complicated, and I'm going to skip straight over. Um, now, the problem is that Dole's is only an Article 5 procedure. It's not designed, and in fact it can't deal with Article 8 disputes. And the typical Article 8 disputes that we tend to come across, don't we, is where someone should live, or what contact they should have with someone else. And there's been a, a few examples of this point being put forward, firstly by the Department of Health many years ago, when Dole's first came in, and they said, other than as a very short-term measure, Dole's should not be used to manage no-contact cases. And that's still being done. Sometimes people are being detained under that regime, really to manage contact with dodgy family members, typically. And it's quite clear that Dole's cannot deal with that Article 8 dispute. It has to go to the Court of Protection. Secondly, Neary says that significant welfare issues that can't be resolved by discussion should be placed before the Court of Protection. So the first point deals with contact. 
The second point deals with welfare in particular residents. If there's a significant residence issue, that may have to go to the Court of Protection. And then thirdly, most relevantly, I suppose, to today is the case of Blackburn, where, as you recall from this morning, C was subject to both guardianship and doles. And the judge said, it's not, in my view, appropriate for genuinely contested issues about the place of residence of a resisting incapacitated person to be determined either under the guardianship re regime or by means of a standard authorization under doles. And he went so far as to say that use of both is an alerting factor to the appropriateness of guardianship. So in other words, he's saying if we are in a position where someone is subject to both, we really need to be thinking whether it's appropriate in the circumstances, even though that scenario is expressly envisaged by doles. And he said, rather than relying on the tribunal and saying, well, if you want to challenge this, there's the tribunal, he says, no, these cases should come to the court of protection. The trouble, I think, with that approach um, is not only that Dole's expressly allows you to use both regimes, but also there's only so much that the Court of Protection can do. Uh, for those of you who've been involved in a Mental Capacity Act case, you'll know that the Court of Protection can only make a decision that the person could make if they had the capacity to do so. That's it. They can't compel, for example, a local or health authority to provide a particular package of care that they're not willing to provide. Because that's not something I could do if I had capacity. So to some extent, the Court of Protection is quite powerless. And it's all well, good, well and good saying, well, the court can decide residence. But let's imagine a scenario like the Blackburn case, where you've got someone who is being required to reside in a care home where they don't want to be. They're on one-to-one -one supervision inside and in the community. They're objecting to being there. If they try and leave when there's no one available, they're distracted. But let's imagine they want to live in their own home. Now, he didn't have his own home, but let's imagine that he did. On the basis of the Blackburn case, you shouldn't rely on the tribunal. You should take that to the Court of Protection. If that case got to the Court of Protection, the question would be to Blackburn, are you willing to provide a care package to enable this man to go home? Now, it might cost £500 to meet his needs in the care home and £2,500 to meet his needs at home on a weekly basis. And if they say, quite lawfully, we are not prepared to spend £2,500 a week, there is nothing the Court of Protection can do about that. They cannot determine that he should live anywhere other than, effectively, where the local authority are saying they're willing to provide the care. So in reality, I'm not sure how much the Court of Protection can do that the tribunal itself can't. And of course, the Court of Protection is only available for those that lack capacity. What if you've got someone under guardianship who has capacity and is saying no? Court of Protection is not an option. It has no, no jurisdiction to deal with that at all. And this morning, we've mentioned some of the problems with guardianship and how it might be improved. And I suppose I would emphasize four of them. First, the need to associate a learning disability with abnormal aggression or seriously irresponsible conduct. That's excluding a lot of people who might otherwise benefit from guardianship. So doing away with that might help. And of course, you don't need that association for dolls. Secondly, there's no issue of capacity with guardianship at all. You don't have to consider it. Perhaps we should. Thirdly, best interest doesn't feature at all 
when it comes to guardianship. And finally, there's no emergency provision. For those of you who have tried guardianship, you may, I don't know how quickly your procedures are, how quick your procedures are, but sometimes it can be very difficult to set up guardianship in an emergency. So those are four issues that I think perhaps could be um, improved if guardianship is going to be um, a serious contender. And what I want to focus on now is um, how it's quite interesting that there's case law to say that the local authority should be the servant of those in need of support and assistance, not their master. Whereas for guardianship, it's quite clear that the local authority is the master. And how does that feature and bear upon Article 8? Well, as you know, Article 8 respects four domains of our lives, our private life, our family life, our home, and our correspondence. But unlike Article 5, which requires a legal procedure, Article 8 doesn't. And we interfere with Article 8 all the time on the ground. But of course, that doesn't mean it's unlawful, because this is a qualified human right. We can interfere, provided it's necessary, and provided our objective is legitimate, typically to protect the person or others, and provided what we do is proportionate. Now, whether it's the tribunal, the court of protection, or something else like judicial review that should deal with this, I think in many respects, Article 8 provides the main fetter on a guardian's power to determine residence. So I just want to look at it in a bit more depth. It provides substantive protection. In other words, it says that the objective must be sufficiently important to justify limiting a fundamental right. So applying that to guardianship, if we're going to use guardianship and if we're going to require someone to reside somewhere that they don't want to be, we are obviously interfering with their Article 8 rights, but provided we're pursuing the right objective, then there's no problem. And typically, we're talking about welfare or protecting others. The second requirement is that the measures designed to meet that objective must be rationally connected to it, not arbitrary or unfair. So to give you uh, an example of where that might be breached, let's imagine that you have a, a very arbitrary guardian around here. I'm sure he's not. Um, but let's imagine that you do. And the guardian is deciding where someone should live. And there are two care homes available. One is much closer to the council's offices than the other. So it's much more convenient for the guardian. To require the person to reside in the local care home would obviously breach Article 8, because that is unfair. Distance from the guardian would not be um, rationally connected to the objective. Thirdly, it must be proportionate. And so, of course, if the person has nowhere else to live, requiring them to reside somewhere will be proportionate to what you're trying to achieve. If they do have an alternative address to go to, then you need to do more to justify interfering with that right. Now, under the Mental Capacity Act and Court of Protection, there's been loads of case law coming out, looking at loads of different issues. And one of the things that has been emphasised is the fact that Article 8 doesn't just prevent arbitrary, unjustified interferences with where someone should live, but there's also a procedural guarantee as well. There has to be dignity in the process. You have to involve people in the decision-making when you're deciding where it's best for someone to live. And that's emphasised in the legislation and elsewhere. Now, to what extent is there procedural protection when it comes to guardianship and determining residence? Because, of course, the power to decide where you live is exclusive and it's exclusively in the hands of the guardian. No one else. Not even the Court of Protection. Now under 
the rule of law, no one is above the law. But the guardian is above the court of protection. But not above the high court. And I think, t- to some extent, guardianship has been built on slightly sandy foundations. Because, as we heard this morning, the nearest relative can discharge someone from guardianship like that without giving any notice at all to the guardian, without there being enough time to start displacement proceedings. If I'm the nearest relative and I serve notice of discharge, that's it. They're gone. The horse has bolted. So I think guardianship is quite vulnerable to the use of the discharge power by the nearest relative. What substantive protection is there for someone who's under guardianship? Well, as I say, capacity doesn't feature at all. So far as best interest is concerned, the guardian isn't legally required to consider where it's in someone's best interest to live. It's their call. How are they going to challenge that? Very difficult. Ultimately, it seems, you've got the tribunal system there. They may be able, through various mechanisms, to exert a bit of pressure if they think that someone really is living in the wrong place. But ultimately, they have no power to move the person. The only power they have is to pull the rug from under the guardian and discharge the guardianship entirely. What about procedural safeguards? Well, of course, when it comes to admitting someone in the first place or receiving them into guardianship, you have your two medical recommendations, you have your independent AMP, you have your nearest relative who has the power to veto everything. So there's plenty of safeguards there when, it, when we look at the, the admission process, the initial reception process. But once they're in guardianship, what protection is there procedurally? There isn't a lot. One of the things about guardianship is that it sets up a single decision maker, the guardian. And that may be a good thing. It's certainly clear who should be deciding on residence and so on and so forth. Or some might say it's a bad thing because it's arbitrary and it's not inclusive and doesn't require consultation. And really, the only procedural safeguard you've got once you're in guardianship, I think, is the nearest relative's power to discharge and the tribunal system. But as we've seen, the tribunal, on the face of it, and the court of protection are fairly powerless. And in Blackburn, they said, that power can only be removed by the discharge of the guardianship either under the Mental Health Act or by means of judicial review to the extent that that's available. So yes, you can use judicial review, you can take a guardian to the administrative court, but those cases are very difficult indeed to win. Ultimately, the power of the guardian to decide residence is, in reality, exclusive. Now what I've done is to add a case that was decided last year that looks at, you don't have this in your slides, um, it looks at um, what the future might be so far as using these human rights points are concerned. It's a a Northern Ireland case, so it comes with a big health warning. This is not legally binding, right? So don't worry about it. There are certain bits in this that you might find quite attractive, but you can't necessarily use it, okay? Um, It's not legally binding, but I think the courts in this country would be quite persuaded by some of the things that it said. And it involved a a guy that they called Jay McKay. And he was subject to guardianship. He had a learning disability, diabetes, a history of serious aggression and and sexual risk. And he was required by the Guardian to reside in supported accommodation with two other men. And on the face of it, he seemed quite happy. He had complete freedom inside the property. He went to a day centre each weekday. 
which he enjoyed. He was a member of a garden group, drama group, even went to college. But, of course, he was required to live there. He was only allowed to go to the shop unsupervised for 30 minutes, twice a week. And apart from that, he could not leave his place of residence or the day centre. And what he did was to try to use these human rights, the right to liberty and the right to respect for private and family life, to try and lessen the restrictiveness of the guardianship regime. And it's interesting to see what the High Court said in Northern Ireland, because the first thing was, we need to distinguish between depriving liberty on the one hand and what they called appropriate supervision on the other. And they said, especially when someone is mentally impaired, that can be a very difficult distinction to pin down. And hopefully the Cheshire West Supreme Court case uh, will assist us with that. Secondly, and this is very interesting, I think, for this country, the court accepted that there was an implicit power to grant leave of absence. Uh, one of the criticisms that's often made of guardianship in this country is, yes, you can get them there, you can require them to stay there, you can bring them back there if they abscond, but you can't prevent them from leaving there. Well, in this case, they said, no, there is an implicit power to keep them there and only let them go on conditions. They said you can impose conditions on leave from the place of residence before the person um, departs. So things like saying, well, you can only go at certain times of the day, or you can only go out if you are supervised. They said those are all powers implicit in the use of guardianship. But of course, they must be proportionate and they must be necessary. And so far as challenging those powers are concerned, they said, well, that's not really for the tribunal. If you want to challenge a, a, a supervision requirement, for example, i.e. you can only go out with this member of staff, that's a care planning issue rather than a tribunal issue. And finally, they said, and this picks up on a point that Tony made about the origins of guardianship, they compared this man with an older teenager. And they said that he might complain about the restrictions his parents placed on him, but he generally complies with them, and the restrictions were not so burdensome as for him to want to change his arrangements entirely. And I think the court there is trying to sum up, really, what guardianship is like. Personally, I'm not keen on drawing an analogy between a grown man and a stroppy teenager. Um, but it, it gives you the essence of perhaps what the purpose is, to provide that authority in someone's life. And it might work where you think they might respond to it. So just in summary, to some extent, I think guardianship may not have the flood defences it needs, if the Supreme Court r raises the water level so far as deprivation of liberty is concerned. Because if the test is, well, if you're not free to leave, you're deprived, we cannot use guardianship alone at all. Doles does help, I think. That provides a procedure, but of course that only applies to those in care homes, and it only applies to those who are unable to decide for themselves. So Doles doesn't cater for those in supported living and it doesn't cater for those that have capacity. And it seems that so far as those with capacity is concerned, we may only be left with one option if they are detained and that's to use the inherent jurisdiction. Now what the hell is that? I, see, I can see in your eyes. Well, it's a power that the High Court has to protect the vulnerable. Very rarely used, but the more legislation that we have to deal with the, and the more problems there are with the interface, the more people are looking at the inherent jurisdiction. It's called the great safety net of English law. 
And it's possible, I don't think it's certain, but it's possible that a high court judge might be able to authorise the detention of someone with capacity if they're subject to guardianship. It would be extremely controversial, but it might be possible because we really have nothing else available in our repertoire of amphibious vehicles for dealing with Article 5 problems. Thank you very much.